Welcome to SFL This Week, Season 22, Week 9 Edition. I am delighted and disheveled to be here with you tonight. How are you doing, Mike? Oh, I'm doing good, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on here, as always. Um, you know, definitely excited about uh, you know the weekend that we had in the SFL and excited to, uh, to get talking about it. Let's get right into it. Let's take a look at the Week 9 headlines. Per Coco Loco. Uh, Mike O'Neill <laughs> racked up a 4K23 record 236 yards in DC's incredible win, which we'll get to very early in the show. 21 reasons to set a record. Max Jackson tied the all time solo tackles record with Aquantas Shine. Shout out to Aquantas Shine. More on him later. But Mexico City could not overcome Atlanta. Mm. Four in a row for Charleston. They were 0 4 to start the season. But now we're in playoff position. We'll have a look at your updated playoff picture at the end of the show. Seven in a row for the Minnesota legend. Uh, they uh, hang on to beat Denver 23-17. And Canton has never lost in season 22. Tested, but still unbeaten. Beat Queen City 24-3. What stands out to you, Mike? Oh, man, it's it's got to be the uh, – got to be – Minnesota. We've talked about Canton so much, and it's not to take anything away from them, right? But Minnesota, 7-1 and one right now. Seven in a row is so impressive, especially after the season that they had last season. I mean, it, it is like they put everything, all the pieces together. Obviously, Charleston hot right now, too. So a lot of hot teams in the SFL going right now, but Minnesota's definitely the one that stood out to me. Timothy Wright in the chat talking about the uh, historical stats being disabled. We do have them. You can send me a DM as Ace Fennec did earlier today, and uh, we'll get you caught up on where you stand historically before we get those things out publicly. So those are our week nine headlines. Uh, thank you, Timothy and everybody else for the support. Uh, and yeah, let's get right into it and let's get to quite possibly the game of the year candidate that was in Seattle, DC at Seattle early on. Ty Patak to Ryan Arlovsky ties the game at seven after Lauren Prococo scored a cheap early touchdown in a tie game. It's Doug Day with the interception going back the other way. Much more from Doug Day in a little bit. Handoff to Baloo. Scott breaks off a tackle in Seattle. Builds a 14-7 lead in the third, or late in the first with three minutes to go. Trying to shake off a two-game losing streak. DC trying to get to 5-2. and two. This is Harrison on the return. And Harrison's going to cough it up. Picked up by his teammate Mason Kirby. And how about that? Dipsy do pass midfield getting DC an excellent field position. That uh, That's what you call an unorthodox kick return as Shabazz Synergy fires down the field to Lauren Prococo again. She set the record 236. She was ridiculous in this ball game. Second down and goal. Sack. Aaron Gooden brings down Synergy, but Gooden would get hurt later in the game. The drive ended in a field goal. Dragons back to work offensively. Josh Gill with the touchdown at this point in the game. 15 minutes in, he was the first person not named Lauren Prococo with a catch. Flash forward to the third quarter, 17-14, Dragon Synergy avoids a sack and then throws it right to Doug Day. Pick six, his second of the season. Ridiculous. Seattle takes a 21-17 lead. Yes, more from Doug Day later. Synergy down the field to Prococo. That's when she got the record, Mike. Uh, what mm. an achievement for, uh, for the other doctor of the SFL as uh, Seattle would get aggressive up one, that's a mistake. Picked off late in the fourth quarter after a lot of defense in that second half. That is an interception for the Dragons, getting him near field goal range down 21 to 20. And then Mike O'Neill, one of the best plays of the year. Shabazz Synergy to Lyric Da Vinci after he had four targets, no catches. Da Vinci got it, touchdown DC takes the lead. Oh, that was beautiful, man. And, and it's so cool. What I love about this play is the pump fake that you see. The pump fake there to the running back pulls the safety out of position and just creates a one-on-one -on -one matchup downfield, and, and Da Vinci just capitalizes in that 50-50 ball. And there it was. You saw it pulled him right into that uh, 
right into that runabout, although the pass was so far down the field. Who knows? I mean, that was just a bullet from Shabazz. Synergy made it 26 to 21. The two-point conversion for DC was good. Fourth and 10. What? Oh, my gosh, it's a fake. Doug Day, he's got on the fake. Just go forward. He couldn't get it. He couldn't get it. Now, for context, Mike, as DC's going to pull off the win, 28-21. For context, the Seattle offense in the second half had done absolutely nothing. You wonder if that factored into the decision to try and pull some trickery. It's actually the first fake punt run we have seen in 4K23 history. It almost worked. Good personnel. You said it uh, earlier in the game, uh, Mike. You just credit Coach Type Attack for having the right personnel in the game at yeah. that moment. Just couldn't execute. Yeah, it, it, I mean, you had the right right person in there. I mean, bottom line, though, is Doug Day's not a running back. You know, True. you have to. You put somebody like, else he's not a running there. back. Yeah. So uh, you could have put somebody else in there. Regardless, great effort by Doug Day. I mean, it was almost there. Bottom line is, you know, sometimes it's just not enough. And, and honestly, you know, we talk about it all the time, but sometimes, you know, you have to look at it and say, well, maybe we didn't need to be in that situation if we really were going to win True. this game. Um, so regardless, hats off to both teams because Seattle really opened, you know, stormed the gates right out from the beginning on that and DC turned it around and that was, it was such a good game. Hey Adam, thanks for the support of the product. Uh, <laughs> hey look, it's a matter of opinion, what's stupid and what isn't stupid. Uh, and I, that could get into a lot of that today, but we're not going to do that. DC improves <laughs> to five and two. Uh, Seattle drops their third straight game and uh, just uh just, just kind of a gut-wrenching loss, uh, but uh, Seattle has plenty of time to figure things out. They are now out on the outside looking in of the playoff picture at 4-4. Four and four. More on the playoff standings coming up later in the show. Let's get back to the highlights. Let's go to Atlanta now, where both teams were hyper-aggressive on this evening, including a fourth and inches throw that went awry. No score still in the first quarter. Like, this game was crazy. Mexico City had 21 yards of offense in the first half. And Aquana Shine, we mentioned, who is tied for the SFL record with solo tackles. He gets a sack right there. 3 nothing Atlanta, and then Kay Marion takes the top off the defense. Max Jackson went for the pick and missed. 10 nothing Swarm. Yeah, I mean, Max Jackson really just... It, I mean, it was unfortunate. Obviously, that ball was put in the right place. But, you know, good attempt by Max Jackson. And uh, there would be plenty more opportunities for Max Jackson later. This is fourth and seven. Atlanta decides to go for it in no man's land. And the pass is picked off. Picked off going the other way. It's Charbs all the way down the field for the score for Mexico City. Again, they had had nothing offensively in this first half. And they get a huge momentum swing there with that pick six. Start of the second half, just two minutes later, another one. From Bryant Dynasty, Max Jackson all the way to the house for the score. Jackson, 21 solo tackles to go along with that pick six. And Mexico City takes a 14-10 lead. But the offense could not get going all night. Jeff Spicoli on third and one gets the TFL, forces the field goal. Now four and a half to go in the fourth. 17-13 Aztecs. Look at Bryant Dynasty flying the other way. Talon Steele gets loose down the field. To the 30-yard line as Atlanta. That is a big man, Cam. He's a, a big, big man. man. <laughs> Tries to mount a comeback. How about this, Mike? Boot Chisholm on this play. He has 99 receiving touchdowns in his career. That is reception number 999, and he couldn't get in the end zone. He's at 99999. <laughs> it's like some sort of did you hit, get hit by an 18-wheeler call. 999. Second and goal. Pitch to Jason Williams, no matter. Atlanta's in the end zone, 20-17. to 17, The Swarm take the lead in an ugly, hard-fought game. Mexico City's got another shot. 40 seconds to go into field goal range. What a dime, one of the best passes of the night for Jordan Seibert. It was Bill Henry's first catch. You see Chaz Blackwater warming up on the sideline. But Mexico City, just like Atlanta, all night long. They, they get a little bit too aggressive here. 12 seconds to go. They're in field goal range, but a touchdown wins the game. They try to get it down the field. The pass is picked off by Chris Henry. That's a case of not knowing if you want overtime or not knowing if you want to win the ball game. And Mexico City falls 20-17 to, to Atlanta, who's now 5-3. and three. What are your thoughts, Mike? 
Oh man, Atlanta. I think Atlanta's hot. I mean, that's a good team. I think Atlanta is really on pace right now for the playoffs. And Mexico City too. Don't let that record sleep on you because that Mexico City defense, that secondary is, I think, really, really good. I, I, it's got to be top 10, in my opinion, uh, in, in this season. But man, Atlanta, they're rolling. They've, they've gotten things figured out. Um, I, Bryant Dynasty looks great. And, you know, at the end, the interception to seal the game was such a good play. And, and you know, you talk about playoff teams coming up big in those moments, and that's exactly what Atlanta did there. Now, I will say Atlanta's wins, their, their strength of victory, not up there uh, with the, the upper echelon of the league. They played a lot of teams with losing records. But if Atlanta wants to prove themselves, uh, they're, they uh, are going to have plenty of opportunity to do it. Let's take a look at their next four games. All teams are 500 or above. They've got oh, Florida wow. in six days. Then they have Baltimore six days after that. Then at Houston six days after that. So that's three consecutive short weeks. And then Charleston at the end of the season, who's won four in a row. So if Atlanta's for real, they probably need to scoop up a couple of victories, two of their last four, because their SOV is not where they need it to be right now at this moment. Um, do you see two wins on their schedule here? Because it's a, it's a tough stretch down the road. I do. I do. I, I see I see a win against Baltimore, and I see a win against Houston. Um, I think Charleston's too hot right now. Houston, here's the thing, again, and that's not to say anything about Baltimore or Houston. That's just where they're at right now. I think Atlanta could catch them, you know, in, in a, you know, uh, I don't want to say upset because Atlanta's five and three. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think Atlanta's got the potential to go two and two. I think if you're Atlanta, you're looking at this, if you can go two and two and come out of this four game stretch two and two, I think that that's a huge victory. Uh, it's not noted on the graphic that the game at Houston has been flexed into the Monday Night Spectacular on April oh, the 1st. It is not an April Fool's joke, but both of those teams, neither of those teams, rather, have been on the Monday Night Spectacular this season. No matter what happens over the next couple of weeks, that game's going to mean a big deal to a pair of five and three squads. Yeah, absolutely. I think for Atlanta, just keep... Look, you can only play who's on your schedule, right? You can only play who's in front of you. You can't help it if you didn't get maybe some of the best teams. And I'm sure the people in the locker room in Atlanta aren't thinking that, you know, because they've had an easier quote-unquote schedule that, you know, they don't deserve to be up there with the rest of them. Five and three is an accomplishment, and uh, Atlanta's going to keep rolling. And I think that... I really do think they can split this four-game stretch. So that's a look at Atlanta coming up, and Mexico City falls to 3-5. and five. Obviously a very competitive team right now. We'll see if they can string together some big-time wins down the stretch of the season. Back to the highlights we go as we're about a half an hour from the Monday Night Spectacular tonight between Arizona and Alamo City. Nick Hoagland early on in the quarter. Charleston just continuing to roll in the stormy skies of South Carolina. Dag's Drone Works blimp is in the house. And Nick Hoagland is in the air too, right? <laughs> Seven nothing. <laughs> Nicely done, Nick. I've always wanted to be a blimp. Okay, so John Lakeman down the field, uh, a little bit overshot his intended target. Kai Cash keeping the Houston offense in the game. They would turn that drive into a field goal. 7 3 Predators. Dave Burr towards the end of the second quarter is decked by John Stamango. What a sack. And then John Stamango's teammate on the next play comes up with a huge pick in the end zone. Yeah, it was a huge play for them. Burr, pick, and what'd you see on that one, Mike? Oh, just good coverage on the back end, and honestly, the pressure, the pressure for Charleston was just killing, killing Houston's offensive line. Mike St. Green working it at the bottom of the screen, uh, getting into, uh, getting down around the five yard line, 47 seconds left, Houston's got no timeouts. Third and goal, what do you do? You find Dan Curtis over the middle for the score, makes it 10-7. Charleston put up a field goal just before the half, so we were all tied at 10 going into the half. Late in the third quarter, it's still only 13-10, and Xavier Solomon had his breakout game over 100 yards and a couple of scores. That one, and then five minutes later, this one in double coverage wow. for the touchdown. Uh, he's... he's etching his way into the upper echelon of tight ends in this league slowly but surely as Charleston surges. Mike St. Green, what a catch, and then a tightrope down the sideline. That's good, but it's not good enough as Houston would fall to Charleston 30-20. to 20. 
Charleston, Queen City, another matchup that's been flexed for March 25th on the Monday Night Spectacular here in two weeks. That's Xavier Solomon, James Matthew Jr. Queen City's mm. chasing a playoff berth. Charleston is hot. That's going to be a good one as well. Four game winning streak for the Preds. Oh, they look so good. And, and I mean, I can't give enough credit to that coaching staff. You know, like they really do a good job at, at correcting. I mean, we saw it last season, a, the second half of the season, they turned it on and made the playoffs. And it's looking like they're in shape to do the same thing this season, Cam. Houston at five and three, you kind of mentioned already. They're, they're feeling a little sluggish, a little, a little slumpish. They are on a, a leaderboard that we're going to get to here in a little while because they've had some impressive performances, but they've got to figure out how to put a complete game together. They are on a couple game slide as well. All right, next we are going to uh, Denver where the Minnesota legend were in town early on in this game. A deep drop back and a stop at the one. Kept the game three to three. Isaac Knox getting all the way down to the two yard line. Beautiful run for the legend. And then Colin Hart, one of your touchdown leaders in the SFL, finishes it off 10-3. Man, when he gets rolling, this legend team is tough to stop. Yeah, they're even better whenever he gets rolling. They're good without it. You know what I mean? He can be, we've seen him have sluggish games and they're still good. I mean, you see the blocking right here. They're such a disciplined football team. And whenever Colin Hart gets going, they are as good as any team in the SFL. Start of the second half. You know who's a game wrecker? Max Knight. Knight with the <laughs> sack there makes it second and 16. That basically killed that drive. And then mm. later on in the game on third down, Max Knight kills another drive with Denver down 17 to three with six minutes to go in the third. Back-to-back -back drives that end essentially in Max Knight's sacks. This uh, throw down the field down 23-17 late is broken up. Logan Keel couldn't come away with it, and Minnesota gets the win 23-17. What's not shown in that highlight is Jeremy Mosley and Logan Keel really yeah. turned, the, turned it on at the end of the game. They're actually top five in the league in receiving yards because Denver hasn't had their bye week. Still pretty impressive. Denver almost snuck up on Minnesota uh, due to due to the time that we have left in this show. We couldn't show show the full highlights of that game, but uh, Denver Jeremy Vega stepped into coaching. He said, uh, you know, uh, over this over this past week, still another one score loss. Did you see anything different or more excitable out of Denver just in a yeah. handful of days' time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was watching it. Brooke and I were watching that game together, and she was literally, like, biting her fingernails nearly because of that game. I mean, like, Denver was such a they, – they really looked like a different team as far as the balance. It seemed like the, the plays being called were really intentional with their personnel, and it seemed really good. It's no wonder Denver almost came up with a victory at the end. Logan Keel and Jeremy Mosley were both exceptional in the second half of that game. Minnesota, it's crazy. Seven in a row – I mean – they're the sleeping giant right now because yeah. Canton and Florida are stealing all the headlines and they're just sitting, waiting in the trees, right? That's yeah. kind of their thing. So, anyway, we'll see what happens. More highlights, 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 highlights on this show. Big league as uh, Motor City goes to Baltimore and Elijah Warfield says, I'll be taking that. 7 nothing. Vultures on top early on after... Uh, an early Jack Wigmore interception, but Motor City all night long would just keep climbing back in this one. Baltimore brings pressure. Nobody defends Guy Clawson. Clawson all the way down inside the 30, but at the end of the play is hurt. Wouldn't oh, get up. That was huge. And wouldn't come back. That was a big moment in that game, but Motor City would prevail. They got a one-yard touchdown from Rivera. 7-7 T-Roy Gaines just shoving grown men to the ground like taking candy from a baby. Or in that case, a king, King Rashid. 14-7, <laughs> Vultures up seven. But Motor City fights back. Shane Kaufman. This, a sleepy, a, a, a really underrated wide receiving core. Johan Sutherland, uh, Shane Kaufman, they are great uh, there. But Baltimore is excellent. T-Roy Gaines, his second touchdown, puts Baltimore up on the first play of the fourth quarter, 21-14. Here comes Motor City. Right back, Adam. A touchdown vulture of sorts. It's not Dean. It's the backup. Tie game at 21, seven minutes to go. Someone's got to take over and make plays for Baltimore. That was Ivory Irvin in the second half. He was almost unstoppable as he gets Baltimore inside the five-yard line. A dominating presence for the vultures in this one. 
This game is tied with 3.42 to go in the fourth quarter. If you didn't watch this game, you wouldn't know it by the final score. But Warren Murray gets into the end zone, makes it 28 to 21. Vultures of seven, and then there you see King Jackson's numbers on the next drive. Jackson tries to lead a charge, just overthrows his intended target. Elijah Warfield with the interception. A fumble, but recovered by Baltimore, and they escape and survive the Motor City V8s. A strong effort, back-to-back -back weeks now from Motor City, uh, in, and uh, they've, they've got to be proud of that performance. Baltimore, again, once again this season, squeaks by a team in the middle of the pack. Um, they get the victory, and they move to 4-4 four and four right there in the thick of the playoff race. What would you make of this game? I mean, I thought Motor City did an excellent job. I mean, Baltimore, we know how good of a, an organization Baltimore is, and they're always going to compete. It doesn't matter who they're playing. They're always going to be in it to win it. And Motor City, I think that this showed a lot out of King Jackson. I know, yeah, he got a, had a couple errant throws where he you know, made some mistakes. But I think the fight that we saw out of Motor City was something that that team's been lacking for a couple seasons. Um, the fight out of that you know, relatively underrated uh, wide receiving core, like you talked about, Johan Sutherland could be one of the the best not really known wide receivers in this league um so I, I really think that there's a lot there to unpack if you're motor city i think if you're a motor fit city fan there's a lot to be hopeful about and for baltimore look taking care of business keep it going you know you're always trying to get to the the end game and the post game so we've seen them do it and they're just trying to keep it ro rolling listen there were a lot of teams this week that scored three six seven points we've seen that all season long motor city put up 21 on the road in baltimore this is not, uh, they're not playing like one of the uh, uh, worst teams in the league right now. They are playing competitive football right. every week. And at the end of the day, that's all you want out of your organization. Let's get to some not so competitive football. Although this game was a lot closer than the final box score uh, were to indicate as well. 24 to three, um, the points off turnovers obviously stand out. I mean, Canton only got seven yeah. points on their own. That's the um, difference. I know their defense just is killing it. But, but I will say Mike, you can't win a game if you're giving up 10.7 yards per attempt mm. on Canton. Like, yep. that can't happen. Uh, the Canton's passing attack really uh, kept things moving for them, and uh, they, they win again, 8-0 for the what? Classics. And it was different, right, because we yeah. hadn't really seen that side of Canton. Um, and I think that it kind of caught Queen City off guard. Kudos to the Canton organization, the coaching staff for throwing something different out there. I mean, you look at the 351 total yards, which doesn't really seem unorthodox, um, you know, for this Canton team. But, you know, 10.7 pass yards attempted. You're averaging a first down every single pass. It's going to be hard to win games. Yeah, so, you know, Queen City, nothing to hang your heads about. I, it was good effort. Yeah. I think the I think the uh, the game chat during the game was was saying such as uh, or just as much to uh, the Corsair faithful. Hey, keep your head up because this was actually a pretty nice performance against one of the best teams in the league. San Diego, your squad, wearing the hat. Love the hat, by the way. 34-7 uh, over Vancouver. Kind of a stunner. Um, again, points off turnovers. Turnovers was a big problem in this game. Um, but uh, you contained Marcus Dunhill. You prevented Fort Worth from moving the football. And, uh, you know, how'd you do it? Fort Worth now, or San Diego now, your leaders in the Pacific. Yeah, I mean, first of all, shout out to Dave Axis for the hat. This is uh, perks of being a coach and, and having a good owner that's uh, willing to take care of you. Um, no, so I, I think for this game, look, it could have gone, I've told everybody I've talked to, it could have gone either way. Fort Worth is the kind of team where, you know, they are capable of beating anybody in the SFL any single game. Yeah. Um, and really, for us, it was all about, you know, having options. We couldn't hone in on, you know, one or two plays that worked really well. We had to say, okay, we have to literally throw everything that we have at them and just hope that, you know, if we get down or if we get in a, a tough spot that we're able to bounce out of it. So this was a uh, more of a numbers game going into it as far as coaching. We want we wanted a lot of options. Uh, we wanted Johnny to be able to have the right plays in the playbook for, you know, to react to whatever Fort Worth was showing on defense. And I think we did exactly that. As far as Marcus Dunhill goes, we knew he was going to hit us with rollouts. We knew he was going to hit us with the, you know, uh, which he didn't with the, the QB sneaks. But it's the same, ultimately same principle with the rollouts, right? right? So we had people sending from sending corners, you know, corner blitzes and stuff like that, trying to be prepared for it. And I think it worked really well. So again, we caught Fort Worth in this one, but if we meet again, trust me, we're going to, we're going to have one eye open. <laughs> the, uh, the speed of the San Diego defense may have been causing Fort Worth some fits, trying to get Marcus Dunhill, you know, outside the pocket in the open field may have been a little bit more challenging. Mexico city's a little bit more of a bigger team. You can just, you can just tell with 
Itera and Jackson and uh, yeah. that being Dexter and Max, right? I mean, they've got a lot of big bodies out there, so maybe they thought they could take advantage on the outside. Not the case with San Diego, but Fort Worth is still leading the South, albeit a little bit slimmer. Vancouver just kind of took care of business last night, 23-3. to yeah. At one point, get this, at one point, Vancouver had a 20-play, 93-yard drive. Look at the third downs, Mike. 15 of 20. That's impressive. One. I had to look back to see if the game glitched out in our official box score uh, from the from our stats team, and it was dead on. 15 of 21. 82 plays in this game. L.A. never had the ball. I mean, mm. they averaged 5.9 yards per run, and I think they had 12 runs. They just, they just weren't on the field. Vancouver. It was, it was impressive. <laughs> Vancouver was nearly five minutes away from tripling the time of possession. It's um, insane. Unbelievable. Yeah, you can't win ball games if you don't have the ball. Um, and that all goes back to coaching, right? That goes to Vancouver. Credit, you know, having the right plays dialed up. If your third down is converting 15 of 21 on attempts, I mean, that is, that's unbelievable. That's second to none. So I thought Provado was really impressive in that game too. Mateo Provado, I liked that they were getting him involved uh, a little bit more. And, and yeah, Vancouver just took care of business and, and it was just unfortunate. It was just a mismatch. It was the perfect game plan for Vancouver. Nearly 20% of Vancouver's plays in that game were converting third downs. Mm. And nearly a third of their plays in that game were first downs. Like, <laughs> it's kind of wild. Hard to lose wild. whenever that, it's like that. Yeah. That's one of the craziest box scores I've seen all season long. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's wild. Kudos to Vancouver. That was an impressive performance on the road. Let's get back to the highlights. Let's go to Portland where the Carolina Skyhawks and Red, Miss Red Shoes herself, Ike McBride, into the end zone early, uh, late in the first quarter to take a 7-3 lead. This was a pivotal moment in this one. Third down and 9, 2.37 to go in the first half. Portland down 4, and Ibari Aman Eaglin reach for the sky. Pick of the end zone in the back. Uh, keeps it a four-point game. Matt South hit as he threw from behind. A vicious hit right there. And he's frustrated that he couldn't get that ball out. It, the drive ends in a field goal, made it 10 to three. This game, low scoring. Someone's got to step up. It's Ike McBride, 6.45 to go in the fourth quarter. Carolina's up 13-6. McBride gets him down to the three. And then two plays later, it is south to McBride and McBride carrying defenders into the end zone. And that's a wrap, 23-6. Carolina gets the win over Portland. Indianapolis and Tulsa. We jump to the second half because there wasn't a whole lot of offense <laughs> in the first half. You were on the call for that game, and things got nutty in the second half. That was Randy Pierce with the catch, and then it's Rob Hunt in the back of the end zone, making sure he gets both feet in. We have a touchdown, ladies and gentlemen. 7-3, to three, Indianapolis takes the lead. Another pivotal moment in this one in the red zone for Tulsa. Down four late in the third. Michael Brown is picked off one-handed by Ernest McCray Sr. This secondary was out of control. Yeah, Ernest McCray Sr., uh, Jermaine Minifield, uh, both of those guys really, really stepped up on the outsides for Indianapolis. Colin Pierce in zone, Ryan Roosevelt. Nice job escaping pressure. Cameron Shaw can't believe it. He was getting worked for positive and negative reasons uh, in the uh, all throughout this ball game. Indianapolis targeting him. DJ Bandit in a game where Gabriel Manning was often shut down. He really stepped up for this squad, gets a key first down. And Tulsa on this drive right here, Mike, they really started to get things moving. Here's a toss to Gabriel Manning. The play calling was excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the play calling was there. Everything was there. You just you had to put it together. And that, that's been Tulsa's biggest challenge is putting drives together. 8.55 to go in the fourth quarter. Here comes Phoenix Jones with a stiff arm. Jones gets outside, chased down at the 12. But, I mean, Tulsa's right in this thing. Uh, on a third down and five a minute later, though, Michael Brown trying to get a touchdown. And look at that. Ernest, or sorry, Jermaine Menafield knocks it away, results in a field goal. So 14 to six, there's Menafield again. This was a one score game with four and a half minutes to go. And every time Indy needed a play out of their secondary, they got it. Yeah, I mean, it was it was just a crucial thing. They needed to play more man coverage and they Indianapolis definitely was taking advantage of the zone coverage at Tulsa. Michael Brown hits Sanzo Robinson uh, for the score. It was his second catch of the game. 
Two-point conversion, no good. And then Indianapolis recover the onside kick to get the win. Ramblers win 17-12. to This defense is also sleepy good. They have been playing great over yeah. the last month. Yeah, Indianapolis is one of those defenses that nobody's talking about, and they really are doing a great job. I mean, you talk about the the Michael Brown Gabriel Manning connection. He was averaging Gabriel Manning was averaging 150 yards coming into this game. And now, granted, obviously you can count total yards. He had some runs out of the backfield and everything like that, but out of the, you know, outside in the receiving core, lined up outside, he was pretty much shut down that entire game. Indianapolis took care of business and and for Tulsa, they just they've got to get their defense checked in there i feel like that team could play so much better if they cut ran a lot more man coverage they've got a physical defense i, I just don't want to see them play conservative because i've watched him watch them lose a couple ball games because of the conservative play calling on defense and mike it's it's probably easier said than done but needless to say there are some teams that probably play better in zone because they've got uh, oh yeah you know better coverage skills or or they've got a lot of speed on the back end but maybe a tulsa team like like that that's just super physical they just need to bow up and start punching people in my opinion look if i were the defensive coordinator for tulsa right now that's what i would be doing whenever you look at a player like berto demora he was incredible off the line and off the edge there and two things pass rush and, and coverage go hand in hand right so if you've got a good pass rush a lot of the times your your corners aren't going to have to cover for as long I just think that that's a good solution for Tulsa, or at least a starting point. Let's jump back to Carolina for a minute. They get a critical win. They improve to three and five. Their last four games, three of them are against teams that are under 500. And the last game is against Florida, who they beat last year. They were one of mm. two teams to beat the Florida Storm last season. But they've got Jacksonville, Louisiana, Motor City, Florida to end. They could be six and five going into that Florida game in that last week of the season if they take care of business. Of course, it's hard to win three games or four games in a row in this league. But where do you see Carolina in uh, in in their in a late season surge potential? Yeah, I, I think that I mean, we're looking at a team. I realistically think you could end this three and one. Um, I think six and six is probably the hope. Right. Obviously, Louisiana is a toss up. I think Motor City and Jacksonville, Carolina can take care of those two. Louisiana is a little bit of a toss up because one week they're amazing and the next week they're they're not really showing up on offense. Um, and, you know, that's they're working on it, too. So you, you never know with Louisiana. But realistically, Carolina could be looking at three and zero going into Florida. Florida's going to take everything and more that Carolina can possibly throw at them because Florida is one of the best teams, if not the best team in the league right now, at learning, at figuring out how to win late in games. Ike McBride's been running better, too. She's now top yeah. five in the league in rushing yards per game. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, watch out for Ike McBride. She's uh, she's really playing well recently. All right, let's, um, let's check out some, some of the leaderboards around the SFL. And this week we want to focus on total – touchdowns because Logan Lee who led last season leads again with 12 Gabriel Manning up there with nine Colin Hart T. Roy Gaines and there you see GP Wells and Josh Slap both with <laughs> seven they are the only team with multiple players in the top five uh, in in touchdowns and it's also worth noting that Chris Kamasak uh, has seven for Florida as well um, an underrated pickup this this season for the Florida Storm but what do you make of uh, some of the top touchdown scores in the SFL this season? Well, I mean, it's it's got to start with with the one wide receiver on the board, right? Like Gabriel Manning with nine touchdowns is is impressive. Um, but you know, looking at this, I think the fact that Houston is able to successfully run a two back system and equally get both of their running backs. Uh, you know, the amount of touchdowns, same amount of touchdowns. I mean, GP is really their heavy set guy, and, and Josh is is the spread back essentially for them and, and they do a really good job mixing it up that's going to be crucial to seeing how houston finishes out the rest of the season uh stephen hacker it also has seven touchdowns he's he's a wide receiver and i think urban mm. is on that list as well at seven but we obviously couldn't fit everybody on the graphic <laughs> speaking of trying to fit everybody on the graphic let's look at the updated playoff picture you've got the top four kind of sitting all on their own uh fort worth with that head-to-head -head over houston is is sitting in fifth um, the head-to-head -head for Atlanta against Houston is actually the tiebreaker there right now. Again, uh, 
Atlanta one and two against common opponents with Houston yeah. because because Houston's beating uh, those better teams, whereas Atlanta is not. San Diego sits in eighth as the leader of the Pacific with Arizona closely behind. And then you've got this log jam of four and four teams right now. That's your cut. Indies at the top of that with a 469 strength of victory. And just like we saw last week, that win over Houston is, or I'm sorry, that win over Arizona is propelling them over Baltimore because Baltimore lost to Arizona and Indy did not. Um, mm. So uh, Baltimore sitting there at 11. Charleston is at 12 at 375. And then uh, Seattle's at 321. Vancouver is at 260, right? A lot of a lot of work to be done down at the bottom of that uh, of that graphic. It's worth noting that Seattle and Vancouver play each other in Week 13. That could be um, a monumental game for them. Um, what sticks out to you with where we sit uh, one week later from last week? Well, I mean, I, I just look at this, and this makes sense. I look at the playoff picture, and it makes sense to me. I think it all starts at the top. Right. Whenever you look at organizations and you look at the leadership at the top of the organizations, I'm looking at all these teams right now and I'm saying, yeah, all of these teams have great, you know, committed front offices that are really putting in the work. And this makes sense to me. I mean, it's a beautiful thing to see this tight of a race where we're at in the season. And it, it's just awesome to see because it just goes to show you that, you know, the work that you do put in, it, it does matter. And, um, you know, I think we're in a really, really tight race now, and it's gearing up to be an exciting finish this season. Uh, so that's a look at your playoff picture. It's worth noting that in tonight's matchup, Arizona and Alamo City, the Scorpions are 4-3. and three. A win would lift them up into that top eight, right? Kick San Diego down to the nine spot. A loss would put them in a bunch of 4-4 four and four mess that would include Alamo City because they're 3-4. and four. So we could end up with seven eight teams at four and four by the end of the night if uh, excuse me oh. if alamo city is able to uh able to get this win so with that being said it's seven minutes and 50 seconds roughly to kick off and mike o'neill uh with his special guest ron haynes of haynes vision has an awesome x's and o's on arizona and alamo city coming up next six four back down 16 10. Dunhill, they're going to keep it in his hands. Dunhill's pass caught by Stevens. And he's... Seattle bringing a lot of pressure. Lakers puts down. Davis Reed out of the backfield. Oh, first down. Welcome back to X's and O's, guys. Alamo City, Arizona tonight. It's going to be a big matchup. One of the big keys for Arizona's defense is containing Brad Jones and the Alamo City rushing offense. I want you guys to watch the defense here for Arizona. Look at the interior line. David Tilly and Hunter Norwood right there, okay? And then you got J.R. Lawless and Sean Moore as support going in behind them. And look at them overload the inside line there and just really get a good run stop against Baltimore. Now, talking about nickel defense for Arizona, it's going to be a big key. We know the wide receivers. Let's look at Parker Thomas right here in the slot. And watch what he does. Look, watch the angle whenever he's covering in man coverage here against this receiver. Look how he goes underneath, gets the interception there. But that all starts because he's aware of who else is on the field. Iverson Gamble's got over top support for him there. Really big key here. This is some of the best run blocking you're going to see all season long. This all starts with TJ Punk getting the chip on the defensive end. But watch the center pull around. Bismarck Wright is essentially just going to walk in here on this toss. This is beautiful. They need to do this tonight against Alamo City. Talking about Alamo City, we're going to look at their offense explosiveness at the wide receiver position. This is 22 personnel, right? This is Joker set here, and this is not something that a lot of teams throw at us, but Alamo City finds a home in these types of situations. Watch Yale Montana here, and this all starts and ends with the ball placement of Ace Phoenix over, over the top of the safety there, and not there, not just that, but look at the spin move and the explosiveness to get it into the end zone. That's a huge play from Alamo City. They have to do more of this tonight against Arizona. Talking about another play here, look at Garrison Blue again. This time, you got twins look, right? But Garrison Blue out of the tight end position, just a seam, gets inside leverage, right? And Ace Minnick puts that on the money. He has to do more of that tonight against this Arizona defense. Talking about Alamo City's defense, watch the creativity here from the corner blitz, right? 
comes out of retirement, and you've got Bo Martin Jr. here, the corner, coming in on a corner blitz. And look at the explosiveness off the line right here to get back there in the backfield and take down the quarterback for Queen City. This is going to be another big key for Arizona's offense to stop tonight. These, this defense for Alamo City is a real defense, um, and both of these teams are a really, really good matchup. This is going to be a good one. Good luck to both of these teams tonight. You wanted to defend your reputation, Mike? Oh, man, yeah. So I didn't even realize. When I, whenever I was watching that back, I, I just realized that I said it was a Joker set, and it was actually a twin set. So before Eddie Gage jumps in the chat and says, actually, Mike, that's a, that's a twin set. Yeah, I, I, uh, let, me, let me defend myself a little bit. There you go. It happens. It, uh, it's Listen, man, I'm about to hop on a plane. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ironic, to, like, ironically, I leave Eric. Like, Ironically, to Arizona, right? I which know, is I which know. is who uh, is traveling to San Antonio tonight. But let's take a look at the matchup uh, one more time before we uh, head to the game. This is the 18th meeting. These franchises have a long history just oh. in the league in general. But it's their first season since uh, Arizona whooped up on uh, the artillery in the season 19 playoff. That was back when they were uh, Lone Star. Really interesting mm. stats in this one. Alamo City has only seven turnovers this season. That's least in the SFL. And oh, Arizona, yeah. shockingly, they are dead last in 10 yards per pass attempt this season. It's odd. You know, you, you don't expect it because they are such a talented team. Um, it's just strange. And it's worth noting that Alamo City is number two in yards per pass attempt. So I yeah. think a big key tonight, um, if you were to ask me, Mike, was is, is to just keep Alamo City in front of you. Um, and not yeah. allow the big play. Ashley Jackson is 320 yards away from passing Tom Pepper for fifth all-time in the SFL wow. in passing yards. So, any final thoughts on this matchup before we go? You got a prediction since you're not going to be yeah, playing the game? Uh, oh, okay. Um, you know, uh, I think that this one might come down. I, 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 could, I look at this matchup and I automatically think overtime, right? Because I mm -hmm. think that these two teams are really, really good at scouting and figuring each other out. It's all going to start on that stat you were talking about, yards per attempt, right? Because we know Alamo City likes to be an explosive passing team out of those heavier sets. It's going to come down to the corners on the outside and the safeties for, for Arizona. The secondary is going to either win or lose this game for Arizona. I think that's what it comes down to. Um, I think Arizona's going to do a good job. Eddie, Eddie Gage doesn't like where Ashley Jackson's sitting with the turnovers, right, and everything. So... Ultimately, I think he's going to play pretty conservative on offense, so I think it's going to come down to Arizona's secondary winning this game for them, and, and I think it's going to be a close one. But, you know, give me – I'm sorry, Soto. Give me give me Arizona by three points. Mm. Um, Arizona by three, I think, is, is what it's going to come down to, and I think that it's going to take everything in the fourth quarter from Arizona because I think that Alamo City will lead a portion of this game. NordVPN Stadium will be rocking. It's a perfect night for football in San Antonio. Charles Doherty is about to join me on the call. Chris Curtis, Tyler Falk standing back in SFL Studios. This has been SFL This Week. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next week for a recap of Week 10. Enjoy the game tonight, everybody. Alamo City, Arizona, coming up next.